colleagues. Hello, come on in, please. So that curve levels off, and you say, I think I'm done, right? So really all you need to do to look at the accumulation of species records is to know that the first day I saw 10 species, and the second day I saw five more, and the third day I saw three more, et cetera, et cetera. So you can imagine kind of lots of information, less information, very little information. In general, we might think that more information is better, but sometimes a simpler, more robust analysis that's less vulnerable to uh, bias or, or false detail, sometimes that can be better. Again, my worry is that abundance data will frequently be falsely precise. But if you're in a situation where you trust your abundance information, great. Um, which is to say the detail possible or the amount of data that we can use in these analyses is often determined by practicality and not by choice. So that's kind of, that's kind of the point of this. Um, let's think about easy versus hard situations. Obviously, small communities are easiest, right? Much easier to make a catalog of a community of two or 10 species than 2,000 or a million species. Um, but where species abundances or species probabilities of ending up in samples are fairly even, it's going to be pretty easy. It's going to be easier. Um, certainly, obviously, good dense sampling is better. Sparse sampling, occasional sampling, irregular sampling is going to be worse. And in particular, the conclusion is that species, communities with lots of rare species are going to be awfully hard to work with. And in fact, in the afternoon, we're going to do an exercise where you guys are going to sample a fauna. Each of you is going to sample a fauna. And you're going to tell me how complete your inventory is, um, given that it might rain in the afternoon and um, most of us don't know the fine boss um, fauna or flora. In instead, we're going to sample little bits of paper out of a plastic bag, okay? But what I've created is big communities, moderate-sized communities and little communities, and communities with balanced abundances and versus communities with lots of rare species. And so we're going to see how these metrics respond to essentially two dimensions, community size and balance of abundances. Questions about that? Your permission not to ask questions and not to interact is running out, <laughs> okay? Time to start interacting or none of us is going to get anything out of this course. Yeah. When it comes to sampling, mm -hmm. sometimes it's the technique of sampling is deleterious mm -hmm. and then it always influences size of the sample to, to, to be acquired. How do you go about that in terms of... Okay, that's a very good comment. Um, it's essentially sampling with removal versus sampling with replacement. If my population sizes are very large, like maybe we're talking about species of plants on the whole side of Table Mountain, and if to sample I need to remove the plant, so long as population sizes are large, removing one plant doesn't substantively affect the probability that I'll detect that species in my next sample. 
okay? So a common assumption is that population sizes are very large with respect to the number of individuals sampled. When that's not true, you know, if you know, collecting a given individual means that there is, you know, one quarter fewer individuals out there to sample, that is changing the probability of detection of that species in the next sample. And so we would need to adjust our analytical <coughs> methods for that. Uh, you'll see in estimate S, it can be done sample-based or individual-based. And so that's kind of one way where essentially we're tracking individuals. But also there are ways of adjusting the probabilities per se. Essentially, if population sizes are not just finite, but also pretty small, then that's going to violate some of the assumptions of what we're, of what we're going to explore. And in terms of also presence and absence, time and sometimes weather is a key determinant. You can get a false presence or a false absence. Then how big your matrix in terms of that? Well, is everybody hearing or should I repeat the question? Okay. Um, essentially, it all comes back to samples have to be as consistent as possible. And so let's imagine I go out eight days and it's beautiful and sunny. Yes. And then the ninth day it's pouring rain. And so I see nothing, right? Or I see very little. In many ways that sample is not going to be comparable. So two ways of dealing with that. One is simply to remove the bad sample. And another is you might have a way of waiting the data from that sampling. So for example, you might say, I'm going to take the total number of individuals detected as an index to how good a day that was. If it's pouring rain, I might only see three birds. And if it's a beautiful day, I might see 500. And so we could weight the, the results of that one day by that total number of birds, something like that. I mean, you're getting at perfectly good concerns about these problems. So what do you do? You either aggregate your data until you can assume that your samples are similar. And I'm going to give you an example later on of looking at birds within 100 kilometers of Nairobi. And I know that individual days over the last century have different probabilities of detecting species. So just as kind of a very simple way of dealing with that heterogeneity, I grouped it into decades. And so I made the assumption that 1920s to 1930s, 1930s to 1940s have similar detection probabilities. Probably also a bad assumption, okay? But I, I've, I've made it better than doing it days by going to decades. Uh, but all of these are things that you need to think about. So I'm really glad that all of these questions are coming up. It's a complex set of questions, and you need to be analyzing your data carefully so that you're not getting fooled by biases or details. Um, and you just need to be conscious of the assumptions that you make along the way. OK, another question? Yeah. And when we want to estimate the population of fishes in our marine protected areas, I wanted to know about the three levels of uh, uh, sampling. What is the best, who is the most appropriate? You mean as far as whether you get abundances or just presences and absences or just species? Um, so I'm, I'm not a marine ichthyologist, but my guess is that you would be sampling uh, by netting or something and not visually. So with netting, you can certainly get to the uh, presence and absence of species in each sample. We don't have to just use the accumulation of species. And the abundances, I don't know. I haven't done that sort of sampling. Um, 
the, the usual best, exam, the best advice when somebody asks me a question I don't know anything about, the answer is yes, which is to say, do both and see how the, the two analyses compare. Um, I'm going to talk in a little while about a different way of sampling, which I call results-based sampling. But we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and that's what, that's what I personally think is kind of a, a best approach. It's got problems associated with it. We'll talk about that in a bit. OK? Yeah, um, I know you've just mentioned that there is another sampling that would combine both. But uh, I think the type of sampling is very much related to the objectives in a way. Because if I'm sampling to compare diversity, I know abundances can have problems. But if you're comparing two sites, and you take presence absence data, for example, they can be the same if we don't uh, compare the, the abundances in the different sites. So I know there are problems with abundances, but sometimes we have no option. But Without a doubt. Yeah, you can have the same five species in two sites, and these two are dominant at this site, and these two are dominant at the other site, and so in effect the two communities may be very different. And yet a species presence and absence matrix is blind to that. So very good points. Just can you add, can we, in, in, when you're actually sampling for abundance, add, let's say, an environmental criterion because to, to guide, to guide the, the abundance or the absences? How do you mean an environmental criterion? Case study, an artificial reason has caused grass to vanish from huge areas. Mm -hmm. So through remote sensing, whatever, it's, there is still no grass in that spot because the trampling effects of cattle and all that. But then that area is still ecologically viable for that particular type of grass. So saving that site in terms of its potential mm -hmm. would guide somebody to know that not seeing it here does not mean it doesn't exist here. Okay. Essentially what you're talking about is what we'll talk about on Wednesday, which is if I want to start moving across space, mm -hmm. how do I structure my sampling? So in that case, I might sample sites with different spectral characteristics. And I might you know, do random points. I might sample random points in a region, but making sure that 20% of them have these characteristics and 20% have these characteristics and so forth. So essentially, you know, you can structure by geography, which, you know, the, the, the usual would be a grid, yeah. right? Uniformly distributed. Or we could structure uniformly in environments. And that's kind of the two options that we have. Um, obviously, the sampling by environments may take you to very strange places. You know, usually it's hard to get to the peak of the mountain or the valley that's far from the road. And so it can be pretty miserable to sample by environment. You know, it can be a lot of extra work. But if your species are responding to particular environmental signatures, that's how you do your inventory. You know, inventory as opposed to sample. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. 